walk by the tomb of Buddha, looked inside and saw his bones, traveled on to see Muhammad still wrapped up. God's own begotten was no longer in that grave. If you knew him like I know him, you would know
Richard, so I'm going to need control of the video, please. How's everybody doing this evening? It's been a, been a good day. Appreciate the opportunity to gather together in the Lord's house and with the Lord's people and to uh, spend some time contemplating His Word and listening to His Spirit. Good fellowship. I'd like you to turn, if you would, in your Bibles to the book of John, chapter number 20. John chapter number 20. It's going to be pretty easy tonight on you. It won't be like, you know, any real heavy lifting or anything. And uh, Boo, yeah, I know. But we've been covering the parenting topic for um, quite a while. We're just about done. We've just got two lessons left. And so this one uh, tonight is pretty straightforward, and it, it really kind of just encompasses and tries to gather together um, the spirit of everything that's been discussed to this point into one point. So we're going to talk about that. So we've talked about what? Principles. We've talked about being involved. Got to be involved. It's hard to parent from a distance. You better be in the trenches with your kids, know what's going on. We've talked about responsible leadership, uh, taking ownership of the place God has given you. We've talked about ethics last week, right? Not only teaching uh, ethics, which is understanding how to delineate between right and wrong moral choices, but one of the most important aspects of ethics is what? Knowing how to know when things have gone off the rails. So ethics is not just the do's and don'ts of life, although it includes that. And necessarily, because we are human, okay, we don't always follow the ethic. So it necessarily must include a knowledge of a perfect, divinely given standard by which we can decipher, am I off the rails? And then how do I recover? So we talked about the fact that training children is not just, uh, as it relates to ethics, training children is not just get it right all the time uh, because this is what you ought to do. It's, hey, this, when you're wrong, you'll know by looking at the Word of God because it shows us where we ought to be. It teaches us uh, the perfect standard in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that and we see, oh, I'm way over here. How do I then recover uh, and so, obviously, the aspects of our faith that pertain to mercy and grace and all those things are encompassed in that idea. Uh, but we have to also teach those things to our children, right? Not just uh, the fact that you can only get it all right. And if you don't get it all right, then it's just the only other option is abject failure. Because in that sense, we really are all abject failures. And that's true. Uh, but it, by God's grace, there's an opportunity to recover, to restore, to make reconciliation. And so that's an important part of it. This week, I want to talk briefly about nurture and care. Okay, when we think about nurture and care, and this is a, a, a mandate that's primarily spoken to the fathers in Scripture. We've, uh, I think on Father's Day last year, preached a sermon on how we typically think of being nurturing as a motherly thing. But the fathers are actually given the primary job of being nurturing. Um, the word husband, right? By definition, what does a husbandman do? He cares for things. He, he watches over and cultivates things. So the very idea of being a husband, being a father, means that there's absolutely um, what God has called us to is to nourish and to care for our children. So I want to just briefly talk about that a little bit this week because this is one of the services uh, that God expects you to provide to your children. Is that he, he expects you to do the work that is necessary to nourish and to care for them. And so we're going to talk about that. And I use these three words um, because this is what I want to kind of ring in your ears uh, as we go through the lesson tonight and as we go our separate ways and to be with you all week long. <laughs> while you're putting in the work to be a parent, what are the three words? Bring them up. 
Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what those words communicate to us, uh, but that is a that is the mandate. Bring them up, right? So you ever see parents that uh, it's just all tear them down? Okay, what is what's the idea? Uh, if you're trying to cultivate something and you act like your children are the weeds in your garden of life, don't be surprised if they want to go find another flower bed to grow in or whatever. I mean, there's, you know, if they, if you treat your children like they're an inconvenience to you, um, that's, that's unfortunately all too common, uh, but you're their kind of the reason they're here to one degree or another. So you got to own that. You know, certainly God has given them to us as a gift, uh, but children are ignorant of parents uh, that don't want them around or find them to be in the way, so to speak. So we're going to talk about bringing them up. This is what I want to uh, communicate to you, that a parent is truly to be a child's chief instructor, educator, mentor, and coach with an eye to their growth and development. Your job as a parent is to develop your child, right? You're training them and bringing them up, right? So this is about their growth and development. So as a parent, it's an eye to what is necessary. What do they need from me to do that? If we think about Ephesians 6, 4, and you might be wondering why'd you have me turn to John 20, because that's where we're going. We're going to John 20. But I put this up here for you so that you could reference it, even though most of you know this by heart, I'm sure. It says, and you fathers, provoke them not to wrath, but do what? Bring them up, right? So this is, this is what? This is a two opposites presented as one idea, separated with a conjunction to show how contrary these are to one another. On the one hand, you could provoke your child to wrath. The opposite of that from a scriptural point of view is what? To bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So when we look at what this verse is telling to us, I want to look at this phrase first, bring them up. Right? The, the idea of bring them up, the word bring actually means to nourish to maturity. So if you just picture um, your child as uh, a sapling, how many of you have ever planted, uh, as a good example, I'm, I'm going to use my dad because it's, uh, he makes a good example on this point. But if you ever planted something and you've struggled to bring it to maturity, uh, there were crepe myrtles, I think, planted in my dad's front yard for a number of years before they were ever big enough to stop getting run over with the lawnmower because they were so small and they just kind of grew right in there with the grass that you'd almost forget they were there and you'd just go right across them with the lawnmower, right? So what do young, small, tender plants need? They need to be cared for. They need to be nourished, right? So the idea of this word is that there is a young uh, plant, a sapling or a seedling that's just been brought into this world and it's just sprouting to life. And the job of the parent is to watch over it all the way until it's mature. Think about what God does for his children. He watches over us day and night. Right now, I'm not talking about helicopter parents, right? Parents who just are always right over. I mean, a kid's 20 years old and the mom's just right in everything that's happening. And now I'm not talking about that, but I am saying that there is um, a sense in which if you take a tree, for example, when you plant a young tree, you know what? We planted some trees out here last year, actually, probably the worst, uh, the worst winter ever for planting anything in Oklahoma. We had one of the hardest winters we've ever had. And so we had uh, huge piles of snow falling off the roof uh, and landing on the trees that we had just planted. And guess what? Since they hadn't taken root, what happened to the trees? They fall over, right? They're not able to stand on their own. They're not rooted. They're not grounded. They're not mature. They're not seasoned. So what is necessary in order to help that tree to restore it to its proper condition and state and to make sure that as it continues to grow, it doesn't grow like this. Well, somebody has to intervene. 
Somebody's got to be watching over. Somebody has to take care. And just as a seed thought from your pastor, if you happen to walk by the flower beds and think they need weeding, it's okay if you do that. Um, <laughs> the flower beds at this church need care. Somebody has to care for them. Somebody's got to be concerned. Somebody's got to uh, look over it and look at it and see that some action is required to restore it to its proper condition and state. Same thing with the trees. Well, that's the idea of this word with our children. That in fact, our children, if we just leave them to the forces of the world, the forces of their own desires, the forces of the natural things, what's going to happen to that tree? What's going to happen to that child? Well, they're not going to grow and develop in a way that is pleasing to God. They will end up being blown about and, and twisted and morphed by the forces of this world and not be what they ought to be for God. So it takes some work. A parent has to be watching over that work. So uh, in one sense, God does, in fact, watch over all things. And in another sense, as parents, he has committed to us the work of being an agent of his to watch over the children he's given us. So it's not good enough, and that's why I say we often see in this life the grace of God at work in uh, the lives of people who were never brought up around the things of Christ. Let me see if I can, if I can clearly communicate this. The, there's families that were oh, never knew Christ, never knew the gospel, they were alienated from God, and the children were brought up in the world and, and all those kind of things. Uh, and God intervenes in that family or in, in an individual's life in that family. And he miraculously uh, intervenes to redeem for himself uh, and for the praise of his name and his grace an individual from that family or rescue the entire family, right, from, from those things. But when we look at families that are uh, brought up in the things of Christ, you know what we typically see? that families who are brought up with the knowledge of God, but turn their back on God and refuse his counsel, refuse his wisdom, refuse his will, refuse all those things, you don't, you typically see a hardening. You typically see um, ears that are closed, hearts that are wax and fat, people who are resistant to the preaching of the truth, right? And so we, we often observe that in the world. And so we need to understand the place that God has given to us uh, as a steward of those children is to watch over and nourish and care for them until they come to maturity, which scripturally speaking is about 20 years old. At least as was pointed out in Sunday school, uh, if you were 19, imagine the luxury of being 19. Uh, and if you were one of the Hebrew children, you're in the wilderness uh, and you probably had the same opinion as your 20 year old buddy who thought, we, can, we should never go, we should have never left Egypt, we, should, we can never take the land, they're way too strong for us. You might have had all the same opinions, but you're under your father's protection. And so, in an act of divine judgment, God, not arbitrarily, but by his own choosing, says everyone 20 years old and upward is going to die in this wilderness. And you're looking at your 20-year-old buddy. Sorry, pal. Looks, looks like you're not making it. You should have listened to the Lord, right? Now, the 19-year-old who had all the same opinions gets to go in the land. Why? Because he's under his father's protection. His father bears his sin, right? There's a responsibility. There's an accountability that he's still under his father's household. So God, all through his word, we see that that maturity is 20 years old. That's when he deems a man accountable to himself directly. Not that we're not always accountable uh, to God, but this is an important point for parenting, that we see we have a responsibility to do this. Um, this word is the same one that's used um, of Christ and how he cares for his church. And he cares for it like his own flesh. Now it makes sense because your children are what? They're your own flesh and blood. You know, we live in a time, it is a sick world. It is a sick world. We're hearing more and more uh, about mothers murdering their own children, about fathers murdering their own children, children murdering their own parents, 
this is becoming fairly commonplace in the news. Uh, and so it's a, pretty, it's a pretty radically fallen and sick world that we live in. And this is, this is God's plan, right? That we should nourish our children just like we nourish ourselves. Now, let me ask you, when you have a need and it's in your power to meet it, do you brush yourself off? No, you don't. Because you cherish your flesh. You cherish yourself. But when our children have needs, guess what it's easy to do? To brush them off. So what Christ has called us to is to, to feel and experience the needs of others just like we experience our own. Now that's a hard thing to do. That does not come natural. And that's why these commands are given to spiritual people, people that are quickened, people that are alive unto God and have his spirit to enable them to do this. But this is an important thing to see that the nourishing that is required is the same kind of nourishing we get from the Lord, right? And so whenever we go on in this verse to talk about some of the other pieces of it, we talk about the nurture and the admonition. What are we talking about? We're talking about instruction that aims at increasing virtue. How many of you have a vision for your family that your children be people of virtue? Do you want your children to be virtuous? And what does that mean to you? And do you talk with your children about that vision you have for them? Do you explain to them that the reason for the type of parenting they receive from you is because you want good for them? You want them to be virtuous men and women. You want them to be men and women of integrity, men and women of faith, men and women with a capacity to love and to cherish others and to care and be concerned and to serve and to do all the things that Christ has called us to do. So it's important for us to think about the instruction we're giving and what is its aim. You know, there's an indictment against fathers in Scripture that says that they chastened us according to their pleasure. Now, now that's taken to mean... Uh, that perhaps also they chastened us according to their mind, right? What they understood. But the Lord chastens us for our profit. All chastening should be for the child's profit, right? We're trying to build up in them some virtue. And so we need to understand that instruction should always be aimed at that. And we see, secondly, admonition. What is the purpose of admonition? Because a lot of children get punished, but they are not admonished. Admonishment builds up the mind. It builds up an understanding. It increases the understanding so that there's a capacity to know why this is necessary, why these methods are being applied, and what is the aim of it? What do you want from me? Did you know a lot of children just simply want to know from their parents, what do you want from me? But when it changes from day to day, the child gets very frustrated and acts out in anger and then the parents get frustrated and they get angry and here we go this is the thing we do but if the parents could clearly communicate to the child this is what i want for you and this is what i need from you then the ch and that is a consistent message in the child's life then and all of the instruction is geared to that same vision for them then they can start making sense of it it's not arbitrary, it's not whimsical, it's not mom's in a bad mood. There is an aim, there's a direction, there is a scheme, there is a, an end game to what we're trying to accomplish. And it's a failure on parents' part whenever we think we're teaching them by punishment, but we don't ever stop to admonish and to explain and to build up the understanding in their mind about where are we going with this. And so it's really important to talk to your children from a young age about, hey, someday you will X, Y, and Z. Someday you're going to need to know this for yourself. Someday you're going to need to be looking at um, things in life for yourself. And you're not going to have mom and dad there all the time to tell you what's right. So we're not teaching our children uh, just on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're actually trying to give them an understanding and take them in a certain direction. Now, the last phrase in this verse, before we go to John chapter 20, is uh, one that probably gets overlooked the most. But it is really 
the, the context for everything else. Uh, it builds up. You know, we talked a little bit about how often in Scripture uh, we see the ideas build so that we, by the end of the passage, are given a piece that explains and builds up the rest to where it makes more sense. That's really what this phrase does in this verse. That we see we're to bring them up in the nurture and admonition, but not just, not just according to our thinking, but of the Lord. In other words, of His mind. When we say we're doing this uh, of the Lord, what does it mean? A couple of things. We're doing it firstly as His steward and as His agent. We talked a little bit about that. That He has commissioned us and equipped us to do this work. But secondly, we're doing it according to his mind and his counsels. It's the Lord's admonition. It's the Lord's nurturing. It's the Lord's correction and instruction. So we're taking what? And this is where it becomes critically important to understand. One of the things you must give your children, if anything, is the faith. Right? The faith. You want to communicate to your children the faith that we preach, and you do that when you can point your children to the direction that you are leading them and the interactions you're having and the chastening they're receiving, that it all points to this because, okay? Because there's a future, because there is a savior, because there's a living God in heaven who has promised these things to us. And that gives us direction. It gives us a light to our path and all those things that the word of God says. So your children need to see and know that mom and dad are subject to Christ. And because they are subject to Christ, then they parent us this way. And a lot of times what happens is mom and dad leverage convenient portions of scripture when they need authority over the children but mom and dad refuse to be subject to the authority of Christ. And kids are not ignorant. Kids see, okay, I see how this works. Mom and dad use this against me when they need leverage over me to get me to do what they want. But in their own life, I see that they do what they please. So we got to be really careful in our uh, teaching and our training and our conduct. Remember, the Lord constantly told the Old Testament congregation that to teach his principles, you must do them. You cannot teach them if you're not doing them. So you do, and actually put them in that order. Do and teach. Do and teach. Do and teach. So we're doing uh, all of this of the Lord, and of course, with his spirit and with his word. So these things speak to us about that last phrase and uh, should inform the way that we go about interacting with our children, the way that we see our role as nurturing and caring stewards uh, to watch over the things that he has committed to us. So just for example, if I were to uh, get each of you a plant, you know, and say, hey, I bought you this plant. And it's a gift from me, and I want you to watch. Oh, no, no, that's a bad example. Let me start over. I just, I just corrected myself. I want to, I want to say that I have a plant is a terrible example because I'm not a plant. But nonetheless, anyways, I would say I'm going to give you this plant, and I really want you to watch over it for me. And I'm counting on you. I'm going to go on a trip. I'm going away. I'll be gone, but I'll be back. And when I come back, I'll, I'll take it back. And I'll recompense you uh, according to your works. Right, this, this example's falling apart a little bit already because you see the problems. Uh, but nonetheless, it's just, a, just for example. Say, I'm going to give each of you a plant, right? So what would, be, what would be a manifestation? What becomes obvious about how you feel about me? What, what's the manifestation of your feelings towards me? How you treat the plant. Right, I mean, if... If I come back some months later and I start going around home to home and I say, hey, I'm here to collect my plants. I really appreciate it. And you're like, plant. Plant. Oh, oh, plant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the plant. Honey, do we have a plant? There's, what happened to the plant? It's like, I don't know. Oh, it's still in the back of the car and it's shriveled up and brown and dead. Right? Because we're too busy 
doing our own thing to think about that. And so we're forgetful when that happens. But as a silly example that's probably a little too lighthearted, do you understand what parenting is? God has given you his heritage. Children are the Lord's heritage. He's given them to you, and he's asked you to steward. That's big. He's saying, hey, watch over this for me. Watch over this for me. Everything that's required from you to take care of this one, I will recompense it to you. But I want you to watch over this for me. That's what parenting is. You're doing it on, for Christ, watching over his heritage on his behalf. And so you're going if to, you, if you love Christ and you value Christ, what are you going to do? Well, it's kind of like anything else. Like the more you thought of me, which is, I know this is a stretch at this point. <laughs> the more you thought of me, the more care you will take for the plant that I've asked you to watch for, right? Because you're going to be thinking in your head, oh, when he gets back, I want him to be pleased. I really want, to, I really want him to be happy with what we've done. I really want him to, to know that we care and that we appreciate him and everything else. Uh, so you would take it seriously. Right? Parents who slight their responsibility are showing how they view Christ. They're showing how they, it's their opinion of Jesus Christ himself comes out in how they treat their children. So when we say the, the nurture and admonition of the Lord, we've got to understand the, the relationships that are happening between the creator and his agents who are acting as stewards. And that's all through the scriptures. So let's turn to John chapter number 20 and look at an ensample, which is a scriptural way to say example. John chapter number 20, verse number 24, and at first glance you might wonder, what on earth does this passage have to do with parenting? In verse number 24, this is right after Christ had appeared to um, the ten, right? That were in the, the room there in, in verse number 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, that's pretty, pretty strong words from old Thomas, right? And I don't know, it's kind of a strange thing to say you want to thrust your hand into the side of somebody who's been wounded with a spear. Um, but perhaps he's just exaggerating. This, this, this is what I think Thomas, you ever known anybody who exaggerates to make a point? I think Thomas is saying, yeah, unless I can thrust my hand in his side, I'm not believing you. I will not believe it for myself. Right? So Thomas is, is very adamant that it's going to take some significant proof for him to get on board with everybody else. Uh, and he didn't, he didn't criticize them for what they believed to be true. He just said, I don't believe it. It's great that you believe it. It's great that you think you've seen him. I don't know what you saw, but I won't believe until I can, right? So from there, we read eight days again. After eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Now, what's about to happen next is very important. Because who was not there the first time? Yes. Jesus was not there for the first discussion that Thomas had with the disciples. Sorry, that was an ambiguous question. Thomas was not there the first time. But then the disciples talked and Jesus was not there. Right? So Jesus was not there for that conversation. But notice what happens when he appears to them the next time. He simply says, peace be unto you. And then he turns directly to who? Thomas. 
Now, had Christ been there? No. But was he there? He, he clearly knows, obviously, as we know, of the Lord, because he's omnipresent and omniscient. He knows what Thomas said. And he shows up to let Thomas know, I heard what you said. <laughs> right? Man, there's a reason that, that the Lord ought to be feared and respected. Right? Because Thomas had been being very brash. Right? The image we get of Thomas in this passage, he's being very brash with his use of language. He's, he's being very, um, you know, animated and, and, and really exaggerating the point to say, I'm not going to believe. Right? Well, in a moment, Christ brings every bit of that right back to his mind. Because he looks right at him and he says, reach hither thy finger. Now, the Lord shows up. And Thomas knows what he said. And the other disciples know what he said. And the Lord knows what he said. But the Lord doesn't say anything about, hey, I heard what you said. He just shows up. He says, peace be unto you. And he looks at Thomas. He says, reach hither your finger. Well, Thomas is kind of on the spot. Right? Because here he's been running his mouth. And so he says, reach hither thy finger. And behold my hands. Say, hey, my hands are right here. Remember what you said was necessary for you to believe? So he says, here's my hand. Reach your finger out. See for yourself. Notice what he goes on to say. And reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. That's unusual language for the risen Savior to be using with Thomas. And it begs all kinds of questions to us about, could he have even done that? I don't know. We just don't know. But the Lord tells him to do it. And he tells him to do it and be not faithless, but believing. What a reprimand right in front of everybody too you know it's like Peter and Paul when Paul got all over Peter right in front of everybody and just uh, you know so the Lord calls him out right in front of the, the whole uh, crew and says hey Thomas here's my hands reach hither your hand thrust it into my side but don't be faithless be believing notice Thomas response seemingly Without taking any action on his own, Thomas says, My Lord and my God. So he's persuaded. So the Lord goes on to say some other things that we're not uh, necessarily going to look at tonight. But I want you to think about this moment, this interaction, because there's something very important happening. There's something very important happening that speaks to us as parents. When we look at examples in Scripture about how God deals with his children. Okay? Now, every, every person in Jerusalem who was doubting, every person in Jerusalem who was struggling to understand, every person in Jerusalem who was unbelieving, Jesus did not personally appear to them. He didn't personally persuade them. You know, we've said before that that Jesus Christ is not an equal opportunity savior. He came to save his own. And he comes to Thomas in Thomas' moment of weakness to appear to Thomas to give him faith and to bring him along when he's struggling. Because Thomas was one of his children. And that, to me at least a part of this story, while you could teach this and, um, you know, preach this in a lot of different ways about this encounter, at least part of the story to us as it relates to parenting has to be that when we talk about bringing up children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord to nourish them, you know, so often as parents, it's easy to say, this is what it is and you come meet me here. But in Christ... We see the one with the strength 
going to the children in their weakness and meeting them there and saying, let me help you here. Now he did it sternly. He admonished him and it was a rebuke. It is in love. It was for his good. And Thomas didn't have a problem with it, right? As is given by his confession, my Lord and my God. I don't think Thomas minded a bit that the Lord took the time. You think, you think Jesus Christ had a lot going on? <laughs> Obviously, it's kind of a rhetorical question. It's, but he makes the time as the supreme ruler of the universe to come to a room with one who's not there yet, one of his own, and to give him that little bit of care that it took to bring him in the fold, so to speak, to send him on his way. And, it, and if you read some of the histories, that's not in the scripture, you read some of the histories of Thomas and what he, what he is seen and known to have gone on and accomplish in the name of Jesus Christ and for the gospel, he went to the furthest reaches of the world and died as a martyr. And it's believed, I don't know for certain, but it's believed that he was martyred with a spear. Ironic. But Thomas would have never gotten there if his father hadn't taken time to come along and nourish him when he was weak. He was faltering. He was in a place where he's vulnerable. And I'm saying, as parents, that's our job. To be watching over and to realize when there's a moment of vulnerability, moments of weakness, and to come alongside and to bring the strength God's given us to bear on their behalf and to bring them along, to encourage them in the faith, encourage them in their life, encourage them in their walk, not with our own empty words of everything will be fineness, but with the comfort God gives and we as his stewards bringing the encouragement of the Lord into their lives as his stewards and as his agents. Nourish them, care for them, bring them up. Amen. Brother Adam, if you come, we'll have a verse of a hymn as we all stand to our feet whatever it may be.